Hey everybody, Robert with RC Archery, and this is part two of how to help you hold steadiest on target. When I was doing the research for this video, I probably came up with enough ideas to do a three or a part four on this video. So after watching this, if you would like for me to continue this series, let me know in the comments down below and I will continue making these. In this video, I have four areas that we can look at that build on what we talked about in part one. And this video goes a little bit more in depth. It's a little bit of that next step as far as what we're looking at, evolving as an archer, that kind of thing that we're incorporating with different um, aspects of the bow as well as aspects of ourself that'll make kind of match together with your shot style and how you like to shoot a bow. All right, guys, the first thing that we're talking about today is the cam. Now, a lot of people overlook this and they're looking at the bow as far as the speed of the bow or um, a draw weight or something like that. So a lot of people are chasing certain things. But what I will tell you is that if we're looking at it from an accuracy standpoint, the type of cam that you're using makes a huge difference. Each archer is a little bit different. Some people like a more aggressive cam, maybe that has a little bit more holding weight, maybe that is shaped differently so that when you get into full draw into that valley of the cam, you're up against the backstops, maybe it's a little bit uh, flatter there. It wants to take off, pull against you a little bit more. Think like a spiral cam um, or a very aggressive speed cam on a bow that's you know, like a hunting bow or something that's built for speed. And then some people like a very non-aggressive cam, more circular in shape, has a bigger valley, is not wanting to jerk your, the release forward in your hand or wanting to take off on you. So when we're looking at bows online and we're checking things out, we can look at the shape of a cam and we can get a pretty good idea of how that's going to feel based off of just what we're looking at here. A more rounded cam like this is going to have a smoother draw cycle and then the more rounded it is going into the valley area where the, the actual cam itself is going against the stops, the more that you get rounded here, the less aggressive it's going to feel on the, on the, the back end in that valley area with it wanting to pull away from you. If you go back and you look at like a spiral cam, I'm going to use that for an example. I think that's probably on the upper end of aggression. <laughs> that cam itself was a very teardrop shaped cam. So instead of you seeing more of a rounded slope right here, it was very oval like, very teardrop like. So that when you were drawing it back, the weight stacked up pretty quickly. And then when you got into um, full draw and it kind of the cam breaks over into that valley area, on that cam it was very short. And because you had that little bitty rounded hump at the end, so it would just kind of get there and then it would, it would pull away from you pretty quickly. On the opposite end of that spectrum, I would say look at like a Matthews um, cam, especially their older target bows, C4 bows, something like that. Those cams are very circular, even more so than what you're seeing here with this Evolve cam. And those bows are extremely smooth when they're getting into full draw, when they're getting into that valley area. So what does that mean for us in our holding steady? What does that mean for us whenever we're wanting to look at that from an archer standpoint? So when we are looking at how we want to shoot and what we're using the bow for in our personal shot style that's what we're trying to match up there if you're an archer that's going to be using a bow for hunting and you need to be able to hold it full draw longer that less aggressive cam may be more what you're looking for now if you're a very short draw archer maybe you need that speed you may have to compromise a little bit try to get a little bit more aggressive cam you may have some areas there but I've coached a lot of people that they get these speed bows because they were just chasing outright speed and they can't shoot them very well at all because they get it full draw and they feel jumpy and jittery and it's tense and they can't really relax into that shot or relax into full draw. So keep that in mind. Now, if you're a target archer, there's different schools of thought and it's really going to depend on who you are as an archer and what you like. Me personally, I don't like an aggressive cam. I shot one for a long time. Um, I did okay with it, but I have noticed now getting into a less aggressive cam that I shoot much more consistent, whether I've taken a break from shooting for a while, whether I'm shooting every day or anything in between. So what I like to do personally is I like a feel of a bow that when I'm drawing it back, I'd like for it to be smooth. I don't want it to stack weight early on or do anything crazy like that because it puts added strain on my shoulder. 
I would like for it to be as smooth as possible. But what I'm really looking for is when I'm getting into anchor in that valley of the cam, I don't want it to be jerking and pulling my hand out of, you know, my, my release out of my hand or my hand forward on my face too easily. What I want to feel is that I can get into full draw and kind of relax a little on my body, relaxing my shoulders, maybe my hand and my forearm a little bit. Now, not extremely to where you're letting go of things, but I am relaxing some so that I can get into anchor. And then from there, I like to build my own tension as I've talked about in a lot of my videos where I'm kind of pushing away from my, uh, with my bow hand pushing away and pushing towards the target a little bit and then pulling away and pulling into uh, the back wall a little bit with my release hand. And I do that and build my own tension. And that way I'm allowing myself to relax into anchor and then build up what I'm needing for that shot based off of nerves or whatever I feel like that day, right? It gives me the option that way. Now it sacrifices little speed, but I'm also not looking for that so much on a target bow with the way that I'm shooting. Now, you can go too far with this, and I have done that with a target bow before where the valley was really big on it and the cam let off so much going into that valley that it became um, an issue as far as accuracy. Now, what I'm talking about with that is the way the cam was shaped and what I was getting there is when I got to full draw, this particular bow needed a bunch of speed knocks knocked up here on the string. And if you don't know what that's for, Originally, they were designed to help take up the slack and the take up of the string going into the cam whenever it started to come off of the back wall. And that was allowing it to um, help with the cycling of the cam and what you're seeing pulling back into it. So on that particular bow, it needed a lot of these because when I got to full draw, you could almost just twist the string around and twist the bow around and there was hardly any tension at all there. And, and while that sounds good, any little pressure changes in my face or my release hand or on my bow hand caused a lot of impact downrange no matter what I did for torque tuning. Um, it just, it always caused me an issue. And the other thing that I noticed too is that because that take up happens slower in relation to other bows, anything that was happening at the shot was magnified downrange as well. So I, I mean, you can get too far with that. Um, so keep that in mind, but that's why I really think that the technology that we're seeing in bows today with the adjustable um, let off and maybe even the adjustable, whether it's like a speed or a soft cam, stuff like that. I think that's huge. I think that's really great because it allows you to be able to test those options and be able to see that. Finding something in the middle is probably gonna be best for the majority of archers. But I would say for 90% of the people that are watching this video, probably you're gonna stay away from those aggressive cams, the ultra aggressive cams, whether it be a hunting cam or a target cam. All right guys, part two in this is gonna be looking at our loop length. A lot of people are fixated on the draw length of the bow and wanting to make that perfect and wanting to deal with that. and they overlook what a loop length is altogether. And I will admit for a newer archer just starting out, somebody in that, that beginning to intermediate stage, adjusting your loop length probably isn't gonna make a huge difference for you. It's just not. Um, but as we're looking at ultimate accuracy, the way to ultimately hold our steadiest, you have to look at that loop length and what it's gonna do for your shot and why it's important. When I go over my coaching, there is a line that I will piece together here in a photo so that you can see it. It's the line that runs from our release elbow, our release hand's elbow, down to our bow hand's wrist. I call this line our leverage line. And the reason I do that is because this line and the height and where it intersects in that wrist area is based off of the length of our loop and how much leverage we have over the bow the lower that line intersects on our wrist typically it means that our elbow is a little bit higher on our release hand side normally that's a shorter loop and then the exact opposite the higher that line is up on our wrist the lower our elbow is on our release side and typically that's a longer loop there are some times that i've seen with archers where they get a false reading on this because they're bending their wrist a whole lot and that's changing their elbow Usually they're doing that because they're trying to get comfortable with where their body needs to be to hold their best. And that's a crutch for them because they weren't adjusting the loop. They were actually adjusting their body and it can be in either form. It could be the loop was too long or too short and they're adjusting and trying to take up length by bending a joint to add the extra length back in, 
or it was too short, their elbow is too high, and they start bending at the wrist to try to bring their elbow back down. So I do see that a lot. Some archers need to have that bend in their wrist. I would say for the majority of people, you're, you're going to want to not have that and try to adjust that loop length to where you can keep a straighter line through that wrist. It's just, it's easier to repeat for one. <laughs> and then two, it allows you to not have extra tension because you're bending it or being so loose and sloppy that you're looking at um, probably a, a, a difference in a sight picture and a float picture is a little bit sloppier and looser as well. So food for thought there and something to think about. So what am I looking at when I look at a loop? I am measuring from the back of the string here to the inside of the loop where the release hooks onto it. And that's what I'm looking at as far as measuring the length. Now, you don't have to get super technical with this. You just have to be consistent with it. You can use a tape measure, use one of those for years. As long as you're measuring it the same way and pulling on it the same way each time, you're fine. For the majority of archers, that's all you're gonna need to do. What I have now is a micrometer. Um, I use that. I have a Husky brand one that I grabbed from Home Depot one day. Suits my purpose just fine. Again, just be consistent with that. Um, the measuring, knowing what you need to be. Now, a lot of people get these from a pro shop and they're set up at like half an inch. I see that super commonly. And for the majority of people, that's too short. Now, if you're using a um, index release, sometimes that's fine for you because that allows your hand to come back a little bit further on your face. You do need that shorter loop. But if we're using a handheld release, you are probably gonna find that you need to be in the three quarters to the one inch range. A lot of people are pretty happy around seven eighths, depending on the length of your fingers, the length of the neck of the release, um, and other factors that go into that too. String angle, that's a big one. On longer axle to axle or bigger cam, target bows, hunting bows, um, that string angle isn't as sharp coming into your face. Those bows, because they're, they're, they're not here, they're more like you know here, they come further forward on our face the way they anchor in. On a hunting bow, it's a little bit more steep angle, shorter axle to axle bows, they come back a little further on the face. So keep that in mind. If you have a really short axle to axle bow, your loop length's gonna be shorter because the string is coming back. Uh, a little bit further on the face. If you have a really long uh, target bow, a really big cammed long target bow, then you're gonna have to have a longer loop as well. Um, I have been anywhere from typically around 15 sixteenths was my longer loop. I got around there in an inch. Um, anywhere from there to like seven eighths and anything in between depending on the bow and, and what release I'm using. So you wanna play with that. Things that you're looking for in your float are if you feel like you have too much leverage over the bow and when you pull into it, the bow wants to pull up really easily or you feel like you can overpower the bow and make it move off target too hard with what you're doing with your release hand, too fast of movements, typically that's too short of a loop. You have too much leverage over the bow. And then if you have too long of a loop, you're gonna feel really stretched out and you're gonna feel like your hand is way back and um, the harder you pull, the worse things feel and they get, so that's just saying you have too long of a loop. Look for those in, in what you're doing and what you're shooting. It's trial and error in that regard and just really tying a lot of loops on and trying different lengths and going through it that way. There's a lot of different ways to tie loops um, and find what you're needing for the length. The easiest way that I have done it and what I do a lot of the times is because I have my bow press here, this Last Chance Archery bow press has a scale on the top of it. And I've actually found that I know how far I need to have a single strand of loop uh, material on that scale. I cut it at that mark and then I use that. I, you know, burn the ends off and do all that and tie it. Now you have to be consistent with how you're tying and how you're um, fraying out the, the ends on that loop. If you frame too much or not enough, changes what you're looking at overall when you get into like, trying to hit a loop wing length within like a 16th of an inch, which is what I'm doing. I want it to be very close. I want it to be exact actually. So um, another thing that you can do, if you wanna do it this way, you can tie your first knot on the top, wrap it around, tie it around, all with this long uh, material of loop length uh, there. You can tie it, get it to the right length that you want it, adjust it if you need to, go back and forth, back and forth until you get it perfect, cut it, fray, and then burn that in there. So that, that second way, when you don't know what length you need and you're just kind of experimenting going on it, that's a really easy way to not destroy a lot of loop length. 
um, or a lot of loop material rather when you're trying to figure out that length. Um, if you have a giant spool of loop material and you're doing this yourself and you don't like to burn the, the end on the bow like that and you want to do it, just cut it and go from there. Um, I think it's been a while since I've done one of those, the loops. I think it's like a little over five or five and a half maybe. I don't remember for sure is the length that I get on one piece. And that with the way that I fray it and tie it in with tied knocking points, that gets me around uh, what I'm doing on my loop length right now, which is right around that seven eighths mark. So um, that's, that's just a reference. Everybody's gonna be different. The loop material is thicker or smaller. All that's gonna vary and, and matter too. So use that with a grain of salt. But that's what we're looking for as far as adjusting the loop length. That is part of my coaching program where I can tell you what the loop length needs to be. If you would like a shortcut, comment down below, let me know. Look in the uh, section of the video in the details. It's gonna have a way to contact me or you can go onto my uh, website and you can find the coaching package there. I have them sectioned out into the draw length, into um, our form, bow fitment, what we're looking at as far as shot execution, tuning on the bow, different stuff like that, or you can get a full package, whatever you prefer. But um, if you want that and you want some hand, you know, handheld and, and some step-by-step -step processes, I do offer that. All right, guys. The third thing that we're going to talk about today is our stabilizers. Now, everybody is going to be different. I hate seeing the threads on Archery Talk or Facebook you know, pages, stuff like that, where they're like, hey, what do you put on your bars? What do you run? You know, and somebody says, oh, I run you know, five up front and 10 out back. And everybody's like, oh, everybody needs to run five up front and 10 out back. That's a good archer. He shoots really well. That's what I need to run. That's completely the wrong way to go about this. So. I have an entire video on my YouTube channel that I'll link here to where you can go up and look at it. Um, it's step-by-step -step how to set up your stabilizers. And it's looking at it from a standpoint of, one, our bow's geometry. Some bows, when you don't have anything on there, they wanna tip over so bad that they flip over backwards. Those bows are very top heavy. They need a totally different weighting than a bow that you hold in your hand and it holds level or tilts a little forward or barely tilts back. Most bows today barely tilt back. Some of them are extreme. They do flip all the way over. It all depends on the riser geometry of the bow. The other thing is how hard you're pulling, the types of cams you have, like we talked about before, whether they're really aggressive or not aggressive, and the type of the way that you hold the bow with your wrist. So they call it low wrist or high wrist. High wrist is easy to see. You're, very, you're pushing very much into the top. Think like a recurve bow. A lot of those archers use that. Low wrist is down here at the base, you're pushing into the bottom of it. I will give you my personal preferences and the way that I'm setting up my bow, but I will also tell you that everybody is different, find what works for you. And it will probably change as you progress as an archer. So don't be afraid that if you're shooting a little bit differently, got a different release, changed your loop length, changed your draw length, got a new bow, all of that is going to require you to adjust your stabilizers. It may be little adjustments, maybe big adjustments. It's a trial and error, it's different for everybody. But as you're doing this and documenting things and looking at your float and finding what works best and adjusting, eventually you're gonna find something that is really good for you. Now another thing that I will say is don't do this all in one day and get it perfect and think you're just good for the rest of your life and don't do it all in one day and struggle and think that you're never gonna get it. I would do this over a course of a lot of days as you're shooting and our muscles change from day to day. They can be different one day versus the next and that plays a really big role into our overall float pattern on target. Nerves, what we ate that day, what we drank, anything like that plays a difference in it. So do this over multiple days and then find out what works best. Going another step, Further from that is you may go to an archery tournament or you may be in a hunting situation and maybe you might find that whatever you have set up in practice sucks in that scenario. We have nerves, our body is reacting differently, what we're doing is different, and you may need to go home and try to remember what that felt like and adjust it. Or you may want to adjust it at a tournament. I don't know that I recommend that fully, but to each his own. Depends on where you're at and your skill level and how bad it is and what you're looking for. So I've done that before. I also say that if you don't know what you're doing and you're new to it, don't do that. <laughs> it may mess you up really bad. It may get in your head really bad when you're at that tournament. So um, 
If you want to know how to do it step by step, watch the video that I talked about earlier. If you want to know what mine is set up, I will tell you why I have mine and what I'm looking for. Everything that I do with a bow, with my form and what I am handling, I believe needs to have a point of direction. And I need to be able to push against that point of direction and that helps me hold steadier on target. And it probably is confusing, but here's what I mean by that. I like to have a low wrist. I like to really push into the bow with the bottom part of my hand where it connects into like the joint of my wrist. That's where I feel it. And when I do that, I'm pushing up on the bow like this pretty hard. That for me helps me not have very many dip bangs at all. It also helps me if I relax my pressure, either pulling on my bow or if I'm changing something in my wrist, I see a float change immediately. Helps me know that I did something wrong. Hopefully I have time to let down on that shot and then restart again. The other thing that allows me to do is stack front weight. And for me, being able to stack that front weight on there gives the bow something to work against. It's forcing it to go down as I'm forcing it to go up and we're meeting in the middle based on my shot. I'm not doing that at a stagnant area where I'm balancing it perfectly in my hand or on a machine where it's perfectly balanced because when you go to pull that back, you're going to run into problems. A lot of people do this. A lot of people think that um, they're holding low on target and they need less front weight and then they get really light on the front and all you've done is made that problem magnified and 10 times worse. And the reason you're doing that is because when you're not heavy enough on the front, can't pull in the back end. And every time you start to pull in the back end, your sight picture goes up on the target and you let off that tension to drop it back down. And then eventually you drop down too far and then it's a dip bang or it's anxiety with your aiming, target panic, you know, whatever it leads to, right? A lot of people don't realize that that's actually what's going on. And they think that because their pin going low to take off weight on the front. I'm telling you add it on the front. In fact, if you're an archer that holds low on target, and you don't have a lot of tension built up in your shot, stack some weight up there and force yourself to be uncomfortable and have to really pull on, uh, on the back end and have to really hold that during your shot or increase that during your shot. You're not gonna shoot well doing that, but it's going to instill a new habit to where you get out of the habit of holding too loosely and allowing that pin to bounce up and down a lot. The other thing that I look at is how I'm running my back bar. So I'm looking at it out away from my bow is one angle and up and down as well. So out this way, I don't have a ton of, of movement away from the bow. Some people do um, because of the amount of weight that I have on here and the, the style of grip that I'm using. I want the bow naturally to lean this way a little bit so that I have to push it this way with my hand in the grip. I just don't want it to be a ton. Um, when I have too much and I have to really hold into that, um, that causes me to want to push my shots a little bit this way and I have some issues with that. So I don't want it a lot. So that's why you see my, my rear stabilizer is a little bit closer into the bow, but the height of it matters too. And a lot of people don't realize this, but the height of this bar, whether it's level or a little bit up or down, depending on the riser, that is adjusting the overall length from this weight away from the bow. When it's going down, you're actually, it's, it's acting like you're shorter or like your stabilizer rather is getting shorter or lighter because you're getting this overall mass closer to the frame, closer to the riser of the bow. So when you're fine tuning this and you've got it adjusted to where you feel like you're really good and then you want to see those little differences on target, barely move the, the angle of this up or down and test that and see what you need to do. Typically, you need a little bit less back weight feeling, lower it down. If you need a little bit more, raise it up. But just for me, I try to be level or lower. I've seen archers run it above level and that works for them. You may need to test that and find out what works for you too, but try, generally try level to begin with and then dropping it down as needed. And that would be my recommendation for you. There's a lot of different companies now that make this. This one's an extremely old uh, adjustment tension bar that I have. It's a Doinker one. It's, it's really old, but it's what I have used it for a long time. Works pretty well. Um, but it's got adjustments here on the top. Hopefully that'll focus where you can see, and I mark it with the pencil and that way I know where I'm at. And then when I'm making changes, I can go back to that if I need to, or use that as a reference of maybe how I was shooting or what's going on. And then once I find where I'm shooting best at over a course of days, and I really like that, 
I'll mark it with a pen or a paint pen or something like that so that I can go back and look at it and reference it later on in case something gets bumped or moved. All right, before I get into the fourth part of this video, I'm gonna take a quick second and talk about the membership platform on my YouTube account here. If you are a member already, I appreciate you. Thank you for supporting this channel. If you are not, let's talk about that for a sec. You get different access levels than just standard you know, watchers and members here on my YouTube channel. So when you are a member of the channel, you get a free form analysis. You can send me a video, a picture, whatever you prefer. We will talk about what you're struggling with. I will give you some areas to look at, try to help you through that, do the best that I can with you in that regards. You also get special videos that people that are just subscribing to the main channel here, they don't get access to and they don't see. For instance, with this video, I'm gonna be going over some different adjustments for your shot style, actually looking at where our misses are on target and trying to um, adjust to hedge against the misses and help us be able to make those smaller or what we're looking at, different things like that. So if that's something you wanna do, check that out. There is a link down in the description of this video. Um, you can look at it, it'll tell you what's going on when you click on it, it doesn't take your money, it's not a, you know, making you a member of the channel or anything, it just lets you know what you get and what's a part of it. All right, fourth part of this video is looking at our aiming reticle. Now, this is extremely personal preference and I am different than a lot of archers. When you look at what we're seeing down this scope, some people have magnification in there, some people do not, some people use a pin, some people use dots, um, some people have lights on there. I mean, the, the, the way that you can set this up and what you're looking at is endless. Um, there's so many options there. So what I, what I look for and what I am telling people is to try a lot of different things, take some notes, use it over a course of days, and let you um, kind of build in what you're needing. Now, me personally, I will go through my journey so you can hear what happened with me. I'll do that pretty quick. And what I'm, uh, you know, eventually got to with my setup here, why I'm using this and let you kind of understand that. So for me, I didn't use any sort of magnification on a lens for a really long time. And the reason I did that is because I just never could get my right eye when I was looking through the scope to just fully take over. My left eye always wanted to work in. It created some double vision and some issues and it just always caused me problems. Now it still does, but that's why I built this little device here. Guards my left eye where I don't see anything through the target uh, or through the scope rather with it. And then it helps me as far as being able to let my right eye do its thing, see everything. So I started using magnification again based on a recommendation from another archer. And I don't use a high magnification. Um, I could go higher than what I have now. I just haven't wanted to mess with it um, as far as buying another lens or going through that. It's kind of pricey. Um, what I have works, so I just leave it at that. But as a general rule of thumb, when you're magnifying a sight picture, when you're putting that lens in there, you're going to see more movement no matter what. Um, you're, everything you're seeing downrange is, is magnified. Um, you're able to see the target better. Things are a little bit bigger, but the movement is bigger as well. So don't freak out when you first put a lens in and see that. Um, it's gonna happen. So don't think, oh, I'm just an awful archer all of a sudden. It's, it's not, you're gonna have to learn to deal with it. Your body will accept it after a while, your brain sees it and then it's not a big deal. The other thing with that is, like I said, the double vision thing. Some people can squint their left eye or their non-dominant eye and make that take over in their dominant eye and they're fine. Some people can't, they need a blinder. Some people wear them on a hat. Some people have them on a scope. There's a lot of different things. The other thing is pin or dot. I don't like a dot. I've tried dots. Um, I've tried dots on um, lenses that go in here that have zero magnification just so that I could try a dot. And for me, it just doesn't work for my eye. I, I don't like seeing it, but there's a lot of different ways to do that. There's different colors, there are different sizes. People are putting a dot within a dot to change the color, all that kind of stuff. Um, they make those sheets. You can go on Lancaster Archery's website. You can pull them there. Um, a lot of different ways that you can test that out. Pins, pin sizes. I use a 19,000 pin. I used a 10 for a very long time. 10 works really good on long distances. It doesn't cover up as much of the target. Um, I mainly shoot 20 yards right now, or if I shoot anything beyond that, it's like 50 or less most of the time, uh, 3D stuff, things like that. So I don't shoot a lot of long range anymore. The 19,000s works best for me. What I do is I actually have mine set up with a sight light, have it with a clear fiber, 
I use one of these sight lights here. Uh, these are Zeros. There's a lot of different makers. This is just the one that I've used for a long time. Um, I like it. I trust it. It's kind of small, compact, fits on there really well. Doesn't add a lot of weight. I can change the color of the fiber based on the light in here and I can adjust that. I can make it red, green, or blue. I like to use a blue. That's just what works with my eyes the best. I used a green for a very long time. It works fine. Um, I used a red for a little while and that worked fine too. But for me, even on a five spot face, that blue just is best for my eye for whatever reason. So test those out, try them. That's the easiest way to do it that I found is clear fiber, changing the colors. I love sight lights because I can have a consistent size of what I'm seeing with my pen and the glow on it based on how bright an area that I'm at. If I'm shooting in a darker indoor range, I can lower the intensity of this light and that creates less of a starburst and halo on that light. It dims it down, consistent circle size. If I'm really bright and I'm shooting outside, I can make it as bright and intense as it can go. It may not always work if it's super bright and you're shooting in the light, but for the majority of times, I can keep that consistent size in what I'm seeing. I don't like to cover up the entire spot of what I'm aiming at. Some people do. Some people, like if you're looking at a Vegas target or a five spot target, they'll cover up the entire five, the white part on that five spot target or the entire nine, the yellow part um, on a Vegas face. And they just kind of center it all in there. It works good for their brain. They don't try to peek around it and just sits in there and that's how they shoot. When I do that, I peek. I start moving things around and I get bigger movement and I, my shot is a little notch here and it doesn't work as well. So I personally like to see just the tin ring or slightly less of the tin ring on a Vegas face or that X ring on a five spot face. That's what I'm looking at size wise. I like to be able to micro point in my sight, I guess, where I'm shooting. I don't peek around it, I hold it there. I think part of that is my brain knowing it's in the right spot and then the other part of it is covering up enough to where um, it's not super, you know, move and movement heavy and buzzy or anything like that. The smaller you go on that dot or the pin size, the more movement you start seeing and that freaks some people out. The bigger you go on that, the smaller the movement seems to be. So I think that's why that big pin, big dot works for a lot of people. And, but also know that this is just what I need from trial and error. So you can even get so much as to how you melt the end of that. Um, you can melt the end of these when you're putting them into your fiber housing and make them bigger or smaller. And that changes it too. It's a 19 thousandths pin, but if you, molt, you know, melt that in there or mushroom it bigger, then it becomes whatever. You know, it could be a 29 thousandths pin at that point, right? So keep that in mind too whenever you're looking at this and really just play with it. Find personal preference, what works best for you. Don't be afraid to change that. How far out or in our sight bar is and how long or short our draw length is plays a huge part in that too. And it's different for all of us. All right, guys, if you've made it this far, thank you for watching this video today. Check out the membership portion of the channel if you want to see some additional and extra content, or if you just want free access to me to be able to help you with form analysis, shot analysis, problems that you have with your bow, whatever is going on. Pick my brain. I will help you out with that. So again, guys, thank you for watching this video. I hope this helps you. If you want additional part three, part four, whatever I you know can come up with, comment down below. Let me know, and um, I'll get to work on that. I already have some extra ideas written out. I can get that video made for us too. Appreciate it guys. I'll see you soon.